All right, so uh, welcome back. Hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, today, actually, I think today is kind of fun, but this is where we get into how do you make things that don't belong in a scene feel like they belong in a scene. And I think it's, in the world of Photoshop, it's really easy to like, oh, well, I can cut out something and I can stick it in a scene and yeah, I can fake it, no problem. But there's really, there's an art to how you apply these techniques and how you get something to feel like it really belongs in the scene versus sitting on top of a scene. And today we're going to talk through that. We've got quite a lot to kind of go through today. Um, I'm going to take you through a streetscape scene where we put people that you cut out last week into a street scene. Uh, then we'll also go into like a natural scene with grass because you, how you treat shadows and stuff is totally different. So I'm going to walk you through both strategies. Um, there are some samples online. If you look at exercise 108 here, um, you're more than welcome to, to find your own streetscape or, or whatever to work with. Um, but I have a bunch of examples down here under the city street section and under the landscape section. Um, I'm going to pick from one of these and I've gone ahead and I've opened them up here so that I can um, kind of show you guys them. Um, as, I, as I start to get started here, uh, what I'm looking for is not necessarily the best composition. I'm looking for a street that's very vacant, that has a lot of space in it, that has some pretty obvious shadows because I'm going to use those shadows to help guide how I place somebody in uh, the particular street scene. So this is one that I've used very frequently in this lecture to kind of go through. Again, empty scene, but it gives us a lot of information, a lot of shadow information, uh, etc. Another example here, sharp shadows really helps in terms of determining. So putting somebody into this scene would work pretty easily as well. So any of these are, are fine choices. Then we have the, the natural setting. Uh, where there's grass and, and that sort of thing at the feet to deal with. We're going to talk through a few of these options. I'll come back and pick one of those a little bit later on in, this, uh, in the class today so that we can show you that. So you're more than welcome to pick from one of these examples. Even though they're all going to end up looking similar, that's okay. Or if you want to spend some time searching online and finding your own example, that's fine as well. The problem with when you search online, uh, is frequently you end up with, with images like this one. It's like, okay, well that's an empty street, but there's no real good shadow information. It was an overcast day when they, when they uh, shot the shot. So integrating somebody into this scene isn't going to work as easily just yet. So make sure when you're picking one, uh, don't pick a night scene, for example. Pick one with some really obvious shadows in it. And that's, that's the important thing. So that's why I gave you some examples. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and work with this one uh, for today, though any of them are just fine. Uh, I'm going to download the large size of this image. So the original is 1500 by 1000. Eh, that's not the best size in the world, but we'll go ahead and download that. Maybe I'll download this one again just in case. Yeah, it was a little bit bigger. Actually, I don't know if I've ever done this one before. Maybe I'll do this one instead. Oh, it's pretty small. Anyway, um, so I'm going to go ahead and open up one of those in Photoshop here. So I already have Photoshop opened up. I went ahead and I logged into Photoshop uh, using the Enterprise ID. Now I'm going to go ahead and go to File and then Open. And those were in my Downloads folder. There we go. Use this one. There we go. I'm going to switch my workspace into the Photography workspace just to get rid of some of those uh, initial setup things. I'll press Control-0 to zoom in on this scene just a, just a little bit. And before we get started, I want to take a little bit of time and, and show you how I look at a scene and analyze the scene before I even put anybody into that scene. And so this is not something that you're going to have to do, but I'm actually going to, to draw on the scene itself in red here. Yep, good. It's working. Uh, just so that I can kind of talk you through how I'm, how I'm analyzing certain things. So when I first look at a scene like this, I say, okay, if I wanted to put the person, say, right here standing, I need to pay attention to what's happening with the various shadows. Where's the light coming from in a particular scene? So if I look first, the light is obviously coming from the right side here, shining down this direction. That seems fairly obvious. True? Furthermore, I want to take a little bit of a look carefully at these shadows. Like we could look over here, we could look right here under that shadow. And on all of these examples, the shadows are slightly back from our direction that's coming down this way. So the sun is slightly behind us, shining from upper right down to lower left. 
Does that kind of make sense as I'm looking at this picture? Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm thinking about that, when I go to put somebody in the scene, I have to pay attention to those lighting conditions. So now that I have a general idea of what the lighting conditions are in the scene, I can go look for a person to put into this scene. So I'm not picking the person first. I'm looking at the scene first and then picking the person. So I can, let me go ahead and open up another one of these. Let's open this one. A little bit different. So in this example here, same, same context, I can look right here on this sign right there. And I could say, okay, well, this is casting a shadow down to right there. It's a steeper angle. There's that same shadow angle on the side of that building. And similarly, because this is back from the horizontal, I can tell that the shadow is behind and to the right, or the sun is behind and to the right, casting the shadow down that way. Sometimes it's backwards from that. These two happen to be very similar, but it's going to vary depending on the image that you pick. So you want to pay attention to that as you analyze your particular Scene. So I'm going to jump back to this one for just a second, uh, and let me get rid of, ah, I drew right on my, you know what, I'm just going to open this again. There you go, I drew right on the picture, so we'll just, we'll just open it again. So now it's time to go find a sample, uh, a, a person to put into that scene. So you guys all cut people out. You can also go into the, co the resources on the student website, go into collage images, and you can look at people here. And as I start to look at people, any of these people would be fine, except that I need to pay attention to what the light looks like on a particular person. So let me go ahead and open this one, for example. And as I look at her, I have to analyze where is Where's the shadow? What's casting the shadow? So let's look at this fold right here. That's casting a shadow down. Right there's the shadow. So it's pretty steep, and it's also coming from the left side. You guys see how, how that works? Now, could I flip this image around? Sure. So I could flip the image. That would help. But it's still pretty steep compared to what I'm looking for. So that might not be the best choice. So I come back here, and let's look here. Okay, so we can look right here, and it's not the best cutout in the world. Eh, the shadows aren't particularly good on that one either. We'll go back. Now that one's really not cut out well. I might have to go to my flash drive and pick some of my own cutouts. Um, the other thing to be careful of, ones like this are like studio images where they're, they're, the lighting is completely generic. It's lit from all sides, so you're not getting a strong shadow. So that's not a particularly good one either. Let me go into my flash drive, because I know I have some, rather than keep looking at them. So bear with me for just a second here. All right, so I could look, for example, at these two people. Okay, so the shadow is coming, right? We can look here, the shadow's coming from this leg onto that leg, so it's coming in the correct direction, right? Her shadow is falling on him, so eh, that's, that's not too far out. So that one could work nicely. So I'm paying attention to these people and trying to decide, are they, are they, do they have the right shadows? Do they not have the right shadows? Yeah, that one's similar. I could use that one as well. So now when it comes to putting the person in the scene, we're going to go ahead and go up to the File menu. So I'll go to File, and then I'll choose Place. And I have two options here for Place. I have Place Embedded and Place Linked. So if we're working on really large Photoshop files, we might choose to Place Linked, because if we did that, then it's referencing the original file and not being so hard on the computer with memory purposes. Uh, we're going to do a lot of uh, linked images when we deal with um, InDesign. For Photoshop, especially on a project like this, it's really not necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Place Embedded option here. And when I choose Place Embedded, let me go to my flash drive.
and I thought these two people were pretty good, so I'll go ahead and use them, and I'll go ahead and place them. So when I placed them, they were cut out, so that's good, so the background's transparent, so that certainly helps them fit in the scene. Now, as I stick them here for a second, okay, that's great, they're on the, they're on the scene. Is there anything wrong with their placement? Yeah, they're way too tall. So if you look at the size of a car, for example, and you see these people, you say, wait a minute, they, they feel like they're floating. So the first thing that we need to do when we determine placement is we have to figure out where should eye level be in the image. And this is a trick that you can always use, is whenever somebody is taller than where their eyes should be, so let me bring them even bigger like that, they're always going to look too big. So their eyes are way up high. That's not a good placement. However, if we look in this image, there's always going to be kind of a horizon line. So all of these lines in the image would vanish off to a point. So all these trees, if we continued the bases of the trees in a row, we'd get out to right about there. Do you guys see that point where everything kind of converges? The key here is that we keep people's eyes right at about that point. So even if they're really big like this, they're giant people, if I suddenly pull them down so that their eyes are at about the right level, they don't feel out of place anymore, even though they're really big. So we're going to try to keep their eye level. Now, it's a little bit complicated because they each have an eye level, one shorter than the other. So we're going to kind of average it. So if I wanted to choose, it is so not keeping things in proportion for me. Generally, when you go to move, if you hold down the shift key, it's supposed to keep things in proportion. Oh, no, sorry. Photoshop changed. I'm used to the old version. Uh, if you hold down shift, it deactivates the proportional change. So it's on by default. Anyway, uh, as I put these people there, okay, so they're about the right height for this placement in the scene. But if I were to continue to make them smaller and keep their eyes there, you can see that I can push them further away. Likewise, I can make them smaller still. And as long as their eyes are right about where, come on, there we go, where I want them to be, they get further and deeper into the image. So I can control their placement pretty easily. So let me make them a little bit bigger here. and we'll place their eye level right about there. And so once I'm happy and I've, got, I've committed to where their placement goes, that looks pretty good. You can always fine tune it with the arrow keys on the keyboard, up, down, for a little fine tuning. OK, I'm happy. I'm going to click this check mark here and confirm the place of the image. So that's good. I have them sitting in the scene approximately where I want them to be. That's good. But if I look carefully, let me zoom in here for a second. If I look carefully down here at their feet, they don't really feel like they're touching the pavement. They feel like they're floating a little bit. Do you guys see that? Yeah. So they're floating a little bit because in reality, whenever your foot or anything touches the pavement, there's always going to be some kind of a shadow where your feet land. So I need to be able to integrate a shadow with these two people such that they start to feel like they're part of this particular scene. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and go back to my file, Place Embedded. And this time, I'm going to take that gray silhouette. Remember I had you make that gray silhouette? I'm going to use that gray silhouette here. I'll go to Place. Let me zoom out a little bit. I have to resize it so that it's the same size as these people. So we'll make a few little adjustments. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but it helps if you start from roughly perfect. So there's their silhouettes. That's good. Now, to make it look like a shadow, we're just going to change the blending mode. So we were in normal. We can change the blending mode to multiply, and that shadow is going to then darken whatever it's on. The problem here, I'm going to switch back to normal for just a second, is that the shadow is not set correctly for its perspective. So it's obviously it's standing upright. So I need to change that. So let's take a closer look at the scene, at what's happening in the scene. And we can always get cues from the scene itself. Oops. I'll go ahead and commit to that for right now. So we've got this cone that's sitting right there at that funky little curb intersection. This cone is casting a shadow right there. Likewise, these trees are casting shadows down. This lamp post is casting a shadow down. So we have cues there. This dumpster right here is casting a shadow down to right there. We have cues of what that shadow angle 
should be. So let me go ahead. I'm going to use a line here. If I can find. Sometimes you just can't find what you're looking for. Huh. I don't know. I don't know what I did. Well, we'll approximate it. Let me go ahead and create a new layer here just so that I can get rid of it uh, down the road. And I'm going to approximate and show you guys what I'm talking about. So let me go back to my pen tool. So if I looked at this garbage can here, the sun is hitting all the way on this surface, so there's no shadow on this surface. So this edge is casting a shadow straight down to that point. So I've got that angle. Likewise, if I came over here, this cone is casting straight down to that point. It's actually casting a little bit deeper and back because the base of the cone is small. You see how the shadow goes up and then over? It's a little bit longer. So essentially what I've done is I've given myself an idea of what those angles are. They're pretty consistent. So for these guys, if they were casting a shadow, it would be on about the same angle down to about there or so. So their shadow should be from there, kind of right in here somewhere. So when I go to adjust this, turn that off, I'm going to be on the shadow layer. And actually, it might even help if I rename this for shadow. And I'm going to go up to the Edit menu. And I'm going to go to Transform. And then I'll use something called Skew. And Skew is really good for this because it allows us to carefully control how we adjust this shape. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll start working from the corners. And I'll pull these, this shadow over like that. Then I'll pull it down in these two corners. I'll pull it over a little bit more. And I'll pull it down. Pull it back down. So do you guys see how I'm starting to flatten that out? The advantage here is that I still have the shape of the people casting the shadow. So those, those shapes are still there. I'm just adjusting it so that it gets to the proper angle. So we'll pull that a little bit shorter. We'll pull this over a little bit further. Right about like that. So I'm starting to get this about where I need it to be. Let me zoom in here. And let's look at their feet. I'm going to have to make some adjustments. So this shadow is being cast by this foot. This shadow is being cast by that foot. This shadow is being cast by that foot. This shadow, he's up just about to lift off. So that's pretty close for where that shadow should be. Likewise, my angle here seems about right. It's possible that I might need to pull this around just a little bit further, like that. Maybe even a little bit further. There we go. So sometimes you have to keep tweaking it just a little bit to try to get it. I'll come back here and I'll adjust it so that those shadows are, are matching up with the people there. Looks like maybe I need a little bit more out over that way to make those two match up. So there's always little bits of adjustment. So now that I have the shadows placed, I could even turn back on that original guide. And lo and behold, it's pretty close to what I thought it should be. Okay, the shadows here need to go behind the people. They're obviously not laying on the ground just yet. So first off, we'll switch our blending mode on the shadow layer <coughs> to be multiply. So they're casting the shadow. Then I'm going to take the shadow and put it below the people. So I'm changing the order of the layers. I'll take shadow, put it below the people. And so now they're in front of the shadows the way it should be. And so if we look carefully at my shadows here, See how the, the gray or the black is a little bit different color? It's a different shade from this gray. Yeah. So we need to make sure we adjust that as well. So I'll take my shadow, and I'm going to add an adjustment layer on top of it. I'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to choose a Hue and Saturation adjustment. And I'm going to change the hue of the shadow. So I'll pull this slider over. Now it's changing the whole scene. So I, I don't want it to change the whole scene. So I'm going to tie this layer just to the shadow. And I'll do that by pressing Control-Alt-G on the keyboard. And that 
adds this little arrow that ties these two layers together. So the hue and saturation is only going to affect the shadow. It's Control-Alt-G is the uh, keyboard shortcut. So now when I adjust that hue, it's only going to adjust the shadow itself. And I don't know whether you guys will be able to see it on this up there as well as you can see it when I'm doing it down here on the monitor. It's right about there or so. Okay, so now that I've done that, the other thing that's different is if we look at the shadow here itself, the edges are pretty blurry versus the shadow here, the edges are pretty sharp. So we're going to change that as well. So let me be on the shadow layer itself. I'm going to go up to the filter menu, and I'm going to go down to blur and choose Gaussian blur. And so this Gaussian blur gives us a little uh, preview of the image. Likewise, you should see a preview live on the screen there to there. That's looking pretty close. What we're doing is we're determining the radius of the blur. If I were to increase this a lot, we get a shadow like that. So we don't want it that much. So you have to decide somewhere between 0 0.1. Uh, it's probably going to be about 0.75 or so. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Uh, let's do 1.1. Yeah, that feels about right. So we're going to blur that just a little bit, which helps integrate it into the scene. When I'm done, I'll say OK. I'll press Control-0. And now we can see those shadows and those shadows. You see how they're kind of all blending together. I'm still not particularly happy with my hue and saturation adjustment. Uh, let me try something different here. No way of, um, doing a color picker for these. Uh, you can, but usually the sliders work better because you can visually just see. Let me try a color balance instead. Uh, sometimes you can do it that way. Same thing here, Control-Alt-G to tie it. And then let me boost the blue value. Yeah, that's going to get there a little bit easier. Now they're close. Yeah. So I did uh, a color balance instead to kind of skew it. I like the sliders just because it's, if you pick a color, it's really hard to pick a uniform color in Photoshop. There's so many colors around. A lot of times it won't look as accurate as if you just adjust using one of these sliders, because then you can kind of visually say, ah, that's about right. That's a, maybe that a little too much. And then you can say, OK, that that's, feels right. So the other thing to look at is if you look at the people themselves, somehow, sometimes the, the color balance of the people themselves is off and they stand out in the scene. In this particular scene, I don't feel like they stand out too much, so I don't think I need to do any adjustments. But sometimes you do. In one of the other images that I had, it's not that one, it's, um, that was in downloads, hold on a second. This image here has a little bit of a bluish tint to it. All the gray and everything is a little bit blue. That's what the original photographer uh, shot with. So therefore, doing a little bit of a color adjustment on the people themselves can help that to integrate as, as well. So really, this is a lot about the people and how you put that in. And so if we're looking at this image now, these people, because of the shadows, feel like they belong in the scene. And that's the whole point. So now what happens when a shadow moves? So we can see down here, if I zoom in, that cone is sitting down, and the shadow is being cast up and over on the curb. Well, what happens if I want to do something similar to that over in here? I have to make that adjustment. So let's bring somebody else into the scene. I'll go to File, and then Place Embedded. And I'll go into Today's Folder. And let's try. Try her. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit just so that I can kind of see. So same thing. Remember, I want her eye level to be approximately correct here. Push her down just a little bit. All right, that seems about right. I'll go ahead and commit to it. Uh, and for the sake of clarity here, maybe I'll turn off uh, the people in their shadow.
All right, so we can concentrate just on this one person. OK, so there she is. I have to do the same thing where I have to bring her shadow in. I'll go to File, and then Place Embedded. And I'll take her shadow right there. I'll go ahead and place it. I have to adjust the scale of the shadow. All right, that seems about right. I'll go ahead and commit to it. I'll press uh, Control Plus to zoom in here. And so now I need to use that same skew. Now I'm going to imagine when I initially start here that the curve doesn't exist. So I'll go into my Edit menu. I'll go to Transform and then Skew. And I'll do the same process here with Skew. Now I should point out that this whole process takes some time to get used to. I've been doing this for a long time, so I can make this look like, oh, you just you know, pull these and suddenly it looks like it's in perspective. It will take you guys quite a while as you work through this to understand what feels like is in perspective, how you move it, how you make your adjustments to get that skew to feel like it belongs. This needs to come over a little bit more. It needs to come back a little bit more. Like that. I'm going to come back and make sure I look at things like where her foot is. And that's looking pretty close to where I want it to be. So I've skewed it down flat. I've got the shadow in the appropriate place. Um, I can once again, let me rename this. Uh, good. So I have that. I can switch my blending <laughs> mode into multiply so that we can see through it. I'm going to do the same color adjustment. I'll get to that in just a second. But before I do that, I need to pay attention to the curve. And so the, the photo is a little bit blown out, so it's hard to see the curve. But there's the curve right there. There's a top and a bottom of the curve. So I need to adjust this shape for that curve. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool. So I clicked and held on the regular lasso tool, came down to the polygonal lasso. The reason I like that is it allows me to pick straight edges. So I can carefully come in here, and I can say, OK, the bottom of the curb is right there. So let me select the bottom of the curve, and then I'll select all the way around this particular shape, like that. So I've selected the top half of the shadow starting at the bottom of the curb. And I'll use the Move tool right here to move up the shadow. Oops. I haven't, um, so the reason it won't let me, I'm moving the whole shadow as opposed to just that region is because this is still an embedded smart object. So let me go ahead and right click on the layer itself and say um, rasterize layer. Now it becomes just a group of pixels, in which case I can use the move tool and I can move this straight up. You can hold down shift, that'll help you move it straight up. And so all I'm doing is I'm breaking that shadow and pulling this shadow so that it starts again at the top of the curb. So I've cut it at the bottom. I pulled it up to the top. Now I'm going to use my polygonal lasso, and I'm going to select and draw in between this. To select that piece. Then I'll go ahead and on the same shadow layer here, I'm going to use the paintbrush tool right here. And I'm going to sample the color from this shadow. So I'll come over here and pick on the color picker. I'll sample the color. See the color right there. It should be 75% gray anyway. We created that before, um, but just in case somebody did it wrong. Then I'll go back to the brush tool right here, and I'll brush in that particular section of shadow. When I'm done, I'll click the rectangular marquee, click off, and we'll see the shadow there in the scene. Doesn't quite look right. Let me switch back into normal mode. And for some reason, it didn't like my color choice. So let me go in and, and adjust it one more time here. Sample one more time. I'll paint that in. There you go. So don't have multiply on when you do that color sample. 
because it skews the color just a little bit because it's sampling the color underneath. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch that back to multiply. There it is. I'm going to make sure that the shadow is below the image itself. That's important. We're going to, on the shadow layer, we will go up to filter, uh, blur, Gaussian blur. Now, it's tempting always to just go to filter and then Gaussian blur again. This repeats the exact same settings as last time. If instead I go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, I get the dialog box and I can then adjust my radius, etc. I'm going to drop that radius down to maybe 0.9 because it's a little bit further away and that was already a little bit blurry. And we'll go ahead and say OK. And now we have that shadow as well. I may decide that the shadow needs that uh, color adjustment again. So I could go back in and I used a layer, new adjustment layer, and I did a color uh, balance. And I'm going to press Control alt g on that layer to make sure it ties to the shadow. And then I skewed that a little bit more blue. <laughs> Right about like that. OK, so I'll press Control-0 to zoom out. And now she feels like she belongs in the scene, especially because of that little curve. So I'm, again, paying very careful attention to shadows and how they're being cast. We'll turn these back on. And there, those people are in the scene. So I'm working to integrate the people into the scene. So that's the streetscape example. I could do the same thing on this street. I could do the same thing on this street. It's all the same group of techniques, bringing it in. The key in the urban environment when you're trying to do that collage is to pay attention to the lighting and then to think very carefully about the shadows, because the shadows are what are going to make or break whether it looks realistic or not. When we switch, however, into the natural environment, uh, oops, it doesn't look like I actually downloaded it yet. Let me jump back here and let's look at some of these examples. So as we look at this, you can see back here on the trees, their shadow. This time the sun is up and to the left, shining down. So different orientation of the sun. Some of these, this one's not a particularly good one because it really doesn't, I mean, there is shadow. We can see it down here. It's close to noon. It's very overcast. I wouldn't pick that one. Uh, this one's pretty good. Unfortunately, we don't have good cues as to where the shadows are coming from. We know that the sun is to the right of us up above. Uh, but I don't have any direct shadows in terms of finding the line, though we could do that. The long grass is kind of entertaining there. This one, the shadow is real close to us, so it's very, it's almost high noon looking down. I'm going to download this one, and we'll use that woman from the first uh, example here. So let's download this. I'll go back into Photoshop. I'll open this one up. Uh, and you know what? While I'm here, I'll do this on one of the other ones so you can see it there as well. We'll go ahead and download this one. All right, so I'm going to do it. I'll start with this one here. So I'm going to go into the file menu. Uh, and I'll go to, so just like we did last time, first thing we do is we look at the image. And we say, OK, what's happening with the shadows? They're all very high vertical shadows. They're, they're short there. It's actually almost hard to tell whether they're going forwards or backwards. They're kind of almost straight down. So when we look for our image, uh, we want to make sure that we're choosing an image with those kinds of shadows. So in this scenario, this shadow is actually pretty good because we can tell that the sun is high. Now, the sun is on the left side here versus on the right side. So I may have to flip this particular image as I look at that shadow. So let's go ahead and bring her in. I'll go here and I'll go to File and then Place Embedded. We'll drop back into my flash drive. And we'll go ahead and select place. So the same rules apply when determining where she goes. We want to figure out where the horizon line is, where that vanishing point is. That vanishing point is essentially if you stood on the beach and you looked out at the ocean, at some point the ocean curves away from you and you can't see it anymore. That is what we're looking for. Now, finding that line here is a little bit challenging because there is no ocean to look at. So we have to kind of guess where it would be. We know how tall the trees are, so the horizon line is going to be somewhere in that ballpark. So we want to make sure that her eyes match up there. 
It's always a little complicated in these natural scenes because sometimes you're looking downhill, in which case the horizon line's up a little bit. Sometimes you're looking uphill, in which case the horizon line's down a little bit. Uh, so it's a little bit more challenging than the urban setting. Uh, I have to remember not to hold down shift. So when I start to adjust her, I want to make sure that her eye level is approximately right about there. This is going down slightly. So somewhere in that ballpark is probably pretty good from an integration standpoint. I'll go ahead and commit to it. And we'll take a look at her. So a couple things to note. One, I think the shadow is on the wrong side. No, I think it's OK. So we'll leave her there. But especially in a natural scene, when you look at the feet, they always look like they're floating. That's just the nature of it. So the first thing we need to do before we do anything else is we need to make her feel like she's standing in the grass. And so I'm going to do that uh, by copying part of the background. So I'll use the rectangular marquee tool here. And I'm going to copy a chunk of grass here, like that. I want to be on the background layer when I do this. I'm going to go to Edit, and then Copy, and then Edit, and then Paste. So what that does is it copies a chunk of grass like that. So let's move the grass up above everything. We can turn the lady back on. Notice that I just turned the background off altogether. It doesn't matter right now. So what I need to do is I need to cut out for her feet first. So I'll use the magic wand tool, which is available underneath the quick selection tool. And on the lady layer, I'll go ahead and click the, the background here so that I'm just selecting around her feet. Easy to do, magic wand. I'm going to go to select and then inverse so that I'm selecting her instead of the background. And I'll go to my grass layer. And actually, for clarity purposes, I should rename these. Uh, OK, so I'm going to go back to the grass cover layer, make sure that's selected. And I will then press the delete key, which again cuts out her feet. Now you guys are saying, well, wait a minute. That doesn't look any different than what we had before when she was like this. The difference here is that I can work and manipulate this piece of grass much easier. So I'm going to work on this piece of grass, and I'm going to get some of the grass to come up over her feet. And I'll do that using the clone stamp tool. We used this when we healed those, those images together last class. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to use the clone stamp tool right here. But instead of my standard brush, which we were working with before, I'm actually going to go in, uh, and this is under the legacy brushes. But just real quick, I want to see if they've updated it and given me one of these to pick from. No. OK, so we're going to have to open up those legacy brushes. Um, so I'm going to click on this little gear icon. And I'm going to choose legacy brushes. Yes, I want to load the legacy brushes. And then in here, we're going to scroll down. It's under default brushes. And we're going to look for my grass brush. And there it is, grass. So we're going to choose the grass brush. And what the grass brush does is it allows me, let's see if we can make this big enough to see. Sometimes you have to start the copy. There we go. We're going to hold down Alt to copy from. Yeah, it ended up being too big. Sometimes it's hard to get the preview accurate. There we go. So you kind of see the shape of that grass brush looks kind of like a piece of grass. Now when I copy from, hold down Alt to copy from, and I copy over those, that edge, we can look in here. See how it's giving me the little spikes like grass? So all I have to do is copy from over here, and we cover over that particular piece of her foot. Likewise, we come up this side. like that. You might have to do a little bit more in the front there. All right. So now if I turn on her picture, suddenly she feels like she's in the grass versus on top of the grass. So I did that little bit of clone stamp to get her feet down into the grass. And if we look at her in context here with the rest of the background on, suddenly she feels like she's rooted in the ground. So that's the first step of integrating somebody into a natural setting, is we try to work on the feet and get them into the ground. Now, if we didn't have grass, if it was some kind of rock 
or whatever, you treat it like you would in, in, in a um, uh, streetscape where it's just about the shadows. It's not about the grass. But if we have any kind of grass, we need to make sure we root the person down into the grass. The next piece of this is bringing in the shadow. So the same thing that we did before, we'll go to File and then Place Embedded. And we'll go ahead and drop in the shadow. Shrink that down a bit. Close enough. Once the shadow's in, I'm going to go to Skew. So this one's pretty hard. So it's going to take some, some time to get there. I'll go to Transform and then Skew. And it's going to be a really short shadow. So we're going to drop this almost straight down to get started. <laughs> and then we'll start pulling it over to the side. And we'll come back. It's about like that. <coughs> you almost get to the point where it's hard to recognize the shadow here. The good news is, in a natural context, there's not going to be too much of the shadow to recognize by the time we're done with it. So we get that down so that we've got the shadow like that. I'll go ahead and commit to it. There it is. Now we need to take the shadow and we need to switch it over into the multiply. So let me go ahead and say this is the lady shadow. Perfect. And we're going to switch this over into a multiply like that. So we're casting the shadow down there. It sounds pretty good. Now there's a distinct problem with this shadow. Well, I should put it below the lady there. Actually, I have to have it up top for a second. Uh, I'm going to have to cut out for her legs in just a second. But there's a problem with this shadow here because the shadow has sharp edges. And we're in the middle of a grass field. So we need to make the shadow also feel like it belongs in the grass. And so we're going to do that using the clone stamp tool. I'm going to turn everything else off, except for the shadow. And when I do the front of the shadow here, I'm going to clone stamp using white. So I, I need to, because the shadow is so small, I need to give myself a region to kind of copy from. So I'm just going to make a, uh, a box here. I'm going to use white as my foreground color. I'll use my paintbrush. Uh, oh, I have to rasterize this layer too. So let me go ahead and right click on the lady shadow and say rasterize layer. There we go. And now I will paint in white. I'll end up deleting this box, but I'll paint that in white. And what that does is it gives me the ability to, to use my clone stamp. There's my grass brush. And I can copy from this white down here in front of the shadow. That might have been a little bit big. So I'm essentially, I'm sh sharpening up the front edge, or I'm roughing up the front edge of that shadow. So if I were to turn back <laughs> on the grass layer, see how it suddenly feels like it's part of the grass now? I have to do something similar on the back edge of this shadow. I'll turn this off. Only this time, instead of copying the white, I'm going to copy the gray. And I may have to go back and forth between the two. So let me go ahead and draw another box here. I'm going to sample, using my eyedropper, that gray color. There it is. And we'll go ahead and paint using the paintbrush tool with that gray. There we go. I'll take the rectangular marquee tool, click off so that nothing is selected, go back to the clone stamp tool, hold down the Alt key to copy from. And this time, I'll probably make this a little bit smaller. And I'm going to do grass at the back edge. And it might need to be a little bit bigger. There we go. And I'm going to do that right along the back edge of that particular shadow. So. I made some, some, as I did the grass brush here, I lost some of the white in the front. So I'll come back and do a little bit more with my white. So we'll select that region. We'll go back to my white. I'll use my brush. To, we'll paint that in again. Rectangular marquee, click off so nothing selected. Back to the clone stamp. 
hold down Alt, copy from, let go of Alt, and then we'll color over that particular section there. So it's kind of a back and forth game until you get the shadow to feel like it belongs in that particular scene. Now if I were to turn on the background layer, we can see that that shadow, it's lost a lot of the distinctness of the edges, but it feels like it, it belongs in the grass. So if I were to turn back on the lady here, we've got a little bit of a problem because the shadow um, is, is causing some issues with her foot there. Um, also, I don't think I positioned the shadow quite right. I think it needs to come forward just a little bit more. Yeah, maybe like that. We can see the grass covering over it. And that feels about right. So the last thing I have to do is cut out for that where the lady's foot is in front of the shadow. So we'll go ahead and uh, let me turn off the grass cover here. Let me turn off the background. I can turn off the shadow layer for just a second. I'll use the magic wand tool to select out. Oops, let me be on the ladies layer to select the lady. And we'll do select and then inverse so that the lady selected versus the background. I'll jump up to the shadow layer and I'll press delete to make sure that I cut out for the shadow. Uh, I could also get rid of this rectangle just for cleanliness because I don't really need it. And now when I turn back on the grass cover and I turn back on the background layer, we can see that she's there and she has a little bit of a shadow being cast. So I'm going to do that one again just for repetition purposes. We'll use this scene. It's a much longer shadow, so I need to put somebody different into this scene. I'll go to File, and then Place Embedded. And we'll use this one. Because the, the light's on this side, casting a shadow on that side. Let me make this person a little bit bigger there. Same rules apply, where I think about where her eye line should be. That's too high. Her eye line needs to be right about there. Um, and I want her, so that you guys can see the shadow, I want her back further in the scene. So she's going to be in this, in this part of the, actually, let's move her over here. That way you can, can see the shadow as it happens. OK, so she's now put into the scene correctly. I'll go ahead and commit to it. First thing I need to do is cut out for her feet so that she feels like she's integrating into the scene. So we'll go ahead and use the rectangular marquee tool here. I'll select the piece of grass around her feet. I'll go ahead and go to edit and then copy and then edit and paste. That gives me a, oops, sorry, I needed to be on the background layer when I did the copy. Edit, copy, edit, paste. There we go. We'll move that up top. This is now the grass cover layer. Perfect. We need to cut that out for the woman. So on the woman layer, we will use the magic wand tool. Perfect. To select around the outside. Then we'll go to select and inverse. So we've selected just her. We'll jump up to the grass cover layer. We'll press the delete key on the keyboard. And I'll use the rectangular marquee and select nothing. Next thing would be to use that clone stamp to integrate the grass over, over her feet. So we'll go ahead and go to my uh, clone stamp tool. I have the grass brush currently selected. The grass brush here, because the grass is a lot longer, we need to make the spikes a little bit longer. We'll hold down the Alt key to copy from and we'll go right over her feet. Now in this scenario, remember the grass is longer, so we have to make sure that the grass covers up more of her feet like that because she's, she's walking in much taller grass. Make sense? Okay, so now she feels like she's part of the scene. We could turn on the rest of the context. I can press Control Zero, and yeah, her feet are now embedded into the, to the scene but she still does need a shadow. So same strategy on the shadow. We'll go to File and then Place Embedded. There's your shadow. Shrink it down. <coughs> uh, 
All right, looks pretty good. I'll go ahead and commit to it. Now in this scenario, the shadows are much longer. So they're still going off in this direction. I'll go to edit and then transform and then skew. And we'll pull the shadow out and down. And over. Oops. Sometimes it's helpful to get rid of that grass cover temporarily so you can kind of see where her feet are. Okay, I'm pretty close to where I wanted it to be. We'll go ahead and switch my uh, blending mode into multiply. There you go. And so we're casting the shadow, but we don't have the grass in the front and the back. So I have to work with the shadow one more time here to put that grass in the front and in the back. All right, so there's the shadow. We're going to, let me rename this to shadow. There we go. And I'm going to use the clone stamp, and I'm going to, again, start with the color itself. So we'll go ahead and sample this gray. I'll use my paintbrush tool. Oh, I have to rasterize the layer. I'll right click and rasterize the layer. There we go. We'll paint this in. Perfect. Rectangular marquee, click off so nothing selected. We'll come down to my uh, clone stamp tool. That's way too large. Make that a little bit smaller. I'm using the bracket keys. I'll hold down Alt. And I will work, oops, sorry, I'll work my way along the back side. That's what I wanted to work on, along the back side of the shadow. So maybe that needs to be a little bit bigger. There we go. Might have to resample as I keep working on this. So again, I'm only worried about the back of the shadow. So I know I've, I've got some extra pieces that are coming down in front. We'll cover those up with white in a little bit. All right, so the back of the shadow looks pretty good. Time to switch over to the white for the front of the shadow. So I'll go ahead and select that gray box again. We will replace it with white this time. I'll use my paintbrush tool. Oops. There we go. And we'll paint that in. Rectangular marquee, click off, and then we'll go ahead and clone stamp. I'm going to hold down Alt to copy from, and we're going to copy that white grass in front. Whoops. Sometimes you do make mistakes. Let's keep it a little tighter there. Hold down Alt to resample. Work our way up here. Alt to resample. <coughs> Like that. Alt to resample. Needed a little bit of gray on the back edge there. So I might have to come back in um, with a little bit of gray. And this is a back and forth game. Sample that gray. Paint it in. Back to clone stamp. Oop. Make sure you click off there. Hold down Alt, copy from. Do a little bit more gray in the back on that piece. And we'll go back to white.
Perfect. Back to clone stamp. Alt to copy from. A little bit more right in the center there. A little bit more covering that part up. Right about like that. A little more right in there. OK, so once all of that's done for the shadow, I can delete this extra white box that I was playing with. Select it and delete. Select that lower section and delete. And now we can turn back on the background layer, and we can see the shadow integrating into the grass. Likewise, if we turn back on the grass cover, that's fine. And we can turn on the woman as she's walking. A few things we have to cut out. Same thing on the shadow. So I'll turn back off the grass cover. I'll turn back off the background here. I'm going to use the magic wand tool to select around the woman. There we go. We go to select and then inverse. Make sure that I'm on the shadow layer. I'll press delete to delete that part of the shadow. And then we can turn back on the grass cover. Turn back on the background and like that. So this is one of the challenges here. I probably shouldn't have deleted that um, because it looks like it, I needed a little bit more of the shadow in that section. Uh, actually, I just need to get rid of Right, so as we look at this, I need, I need the, um, the grass to cover up that part of the shadow. So I need more of the um, white to cover up that part of the shadow. So I'll go back and fill in with my rectangular marquee with white. Question? You can, and depending on how you do it, it may. Uh, you have to pay attention to the layer order, and this is something you'll, you'll go through when you go through it. If you place it behind the object, the grass still needs to be in front of the object for the, the grass. This grass cover needs to be in front of where the shadow. See, if I, if I change the order there, if I put that underneath, see how the shadow disappears? So I have to have the shadow on top of that layer. And when I put the shadow on top of that layer, it then because I need the shadow to cast on that layer. So it, it's a layer order problem. Um, so that's why you need a little bit of extra. Anyway, let me turn back off that grass cover. Let me use my clone stamp. <coughs> uh, hold down Alt, copy from the white. And then I just need to cover over the front of that foot. Like that. And then when we turn the grass cover back on, and or when we turn back on the woman walking, it's going to look a little bit better. So sometimes you have to just do a little bit of tweaking to get it to look right. I might end up on the shadow layer continuing that over just a little bit more uh, as we work our way through. Likewise, maybe some more of the darker shadow back in here. I'm not quite sure. You have to kind of play around with it. Um, that's probably the most difficult of the options. So let me go ahead and turn back on so we can see the whole scene. It always helps when you step away as you can kind of get a better sense. Maybe some of those should have been a little bit longer and cover up more. Maybe that white should be a little bit longer to help it integrate. So I didn't want to talk for too long today, um, but I know I did because that's the nature of it. Um, I want you to work through the cityscape, this one first. Then I want you to work through one of the uh, grass scenes so we, we can get through that. I, talked, I, I teach this early on when we're doing Photoshop. Then we'll forget about it for a while, but at the end of the semester, we're going to come back to doing this a lot more uh, when we start to build collages using a lot of the software. Um, so it is something that we'll come back to. Um, today is very much about analyzing lighting, getting people to fit in the scene, and making it look uh, believable. So you're going to have two things to post at the end of class today. One will be the, the city scene, and the other will be the landscape scene.